Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and organizing uh, this, this, this conference. Um, I've certainly learned, learned a lot. Um, actually, actually, my initial inclination was to, uh, you know, go, going first on the second day, was to actually sort of say a, a few words about, uh, um, about my reaction to some of yesterday's presentations, but I, I'll actually resist the temptation because I don't have much time. Um, but all I will do is uh, just uh, perhaps refer to the, um, the first session yesterday, um, uh, when, where the talk was given by Yves, Yves Santoma, um, on deliberative democracy and participatory democracy and the, the contrast and the tension between them. Um, obviously, I'm talking today about deliberative democracy, but I, I think there are interesting connections be between the two. Um, a month ago, I was at the, uh, the annual conference of the American Political Science Association in, in Seattle, and the presidential address was given by Carol Pateman, who is, of course, uh, uh, one of the best-known theorists of participatory democracy. And she was actually arguing for a revival of interest and applicability of participatory democracy, and she actually contrasted it with deliberative democracy, so that was her foil. Um, so she was really sort of con uh, po uh, posing them as alternatives. Um, but she had a very narrow framing of deliberative democracy. Um, she equa essentially equated it uh, with lay citizen forums. I will be talking a bit about such forums uh, today, but we should not make the mistake of, uh, 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 which I think she did, um, of equating deliberative democracy with, with such forums. Um, my own feeling is that it's actually, well, it's certainly possible to be a deliberative Democrat without being a participatory de Democrat. Uh, we can, you know, some, some theorists of deliberative democracy seek deliberation in legislatures, um, in courts, um, in the standard institutions of the liberal state, and are not necessarily interested in participation. However, I, thi I actually think it's very hard to be a participatory Democrat without also being a deliberative Democrat. Um, why is this? Um, because otherwise, uh, the danger is that participation is going to be uh, of a very thin kind of character. Now, this also means that deliberative democracy um, must reach out to make itself applicable to participatory contexts. And to do that, uh, you have to, I, th I think, dispense with um, some of the sort of the old stereotypes about deliberative democracy, that it uh, prizes argumentation above other forms of communication, that it seeks consensus that its regulative ideal is, is consensus of some sort. Um, I think we need to, deliberative Democrats really do need to let go of both of those things. And if you look at the, the way the theory has developed over the last um, 10 or 15 years, we have let go. Um, some of the critics haven't noticed, uh, but deliberative Democrats are not committed to consensus as a regulative ideal. Uh, we do not prize rational argumentation above other forms of communication, okay? So that's just by, just by way of background. Um, okay, my topic today is um, global democracy. Uh, we might ask, well, what's what, what, pos what can participation possibly have to do at the global level? Um, my response to that um, would be that um, all the justifications for democracy, all the standard justifications um, apply at the global level, um, no less than anywhere else. If authority is increasingly shifting from the level of the nation state um, to global institutions, um, often to the impersonal forces of the global political economy, then democracy has to shift that level too. Um, there are some skeptical political theorists, um, uh, Robert Dahl being the most prominent one, um, who deny that global democracy is possible on the grounds that uh, the prerequisites that we find in the nation state are not present there. Prerequisites such as a well-defined demos, um, a sense of national solidarity. Um, I think those, uh, that kind of argument is just, uh, I, I mean, it's it's almost not even worth responding to uh, because the, uh, I, I think the only, question, the only worthwhile question is how do we do it, not whether we do it. Um, otherwise, we're leaving uh, just a, a huge source of really important authority um, in, in today's world beyond the reach of democracy, and I think that's, um, that is simply unacceptable. So the question is how. Um, the arguments, as I say, the justifications for democracy, the general justifications for democracy, apply at the global level as much as any other level. Um, these justifications include legitimacy. Um, legitimacy depends on the uh, degree of democracy in the production of collective outcomes. Of course, deliberative Democrats have a particular take on legitimacy, uh, that it requires um, deliberation on the part of those affected by a collective decision or their representatives. Um, the second justification is simply rationality. Uh, arguably, democracy is uh, the best way for integrating diverse perspectives on, on complex issues. And the third claim, perhaps a bit more contentious, is that um, if we seek global, so global justice, then we also are going to need global democracy. Um, this comes, I, I won't go into the details on that, there's a, a, a recent book by Amartya Sen, uh, which is 
uh, called the, the idea of justice, which um, tries to draw the links between justice and democracy, deliberative democracy in particular, I even though it doesn't call it that, um, and, uh, and also um, tries to apply the, this to the global level. Um, okay, so how then do we think about global democracy and global deliberative democracy in particular? Um, I think there are, there are actually uh, a number of ways of doing this. Um, surprisingly, quite a lot of ways. These are at least five ways. I'm not going to talk about all of them just, just because of reasons of time. Um, uh, we can think, uh, and I'm actually going to dismiss two of them. Um, perhaps the most straightforward way of thinking about global democracy would be to think of it in terms of the image of the liberal democratic state. Um, some people do this. Um, for example, um, Raf uh, Raphael uh, Marchetti in a, in a book a couple of years ago um, really sort of see something like a global state as being um, necessary uh, if we seek global democracy. Um, obviously, that's a, uh, th that's a very long way from existi existing global reality. Um, my own view is that, uh, that this is um, just so far distant from the, the reality of the contemporary international system that it's not actually a very worthwhile way to think about global democracy. Um, the second way we can think about, about it is as a forum, or rather think about introducing global level forums into the, uh, um, into the system. And I will actually have a bit to, I, I will talk about that. Um, that's why the, uh, the asterisk is by, by that one. Um, the third way um, is, is what I, this, this is in a recent article called Soup, Society and System, which um, was published in Ethics and International Affairs. Um, I called it a, a soup. Um, this is really, the, the idea of a, of a, of a soup um, is essentially, it's essentially a minimalist approach to global democracy. Uh, it, um, it sees, uh, in, instead of seeing any kind of overarching logic at the system level, um, what it does is it just sees a variety of accountability practices emerging at different locations in the global political economy. Um, and we, we, can asso we associate that position in particular with um, uh, Michael, Michael Sayward, um, who's a British political theorist who wrote a, um, actually he's originally from Australia, but he's in Britain now, um, he wrote, who um, wrote an article a couple of years ago um, called Instead of Global Democracy. So he was, he's, he, and, and he's thinking that these, these multiple disconnected practices um, uh, it make more sense and we should just look at those in isolation. And they don't add up to anything. Um, they don't presage any sort of grander development towards global democracy. Um, uh, I'm going to dismiss that um, simply on the grounds that, uh, well, it, it, it really is hard to know what to make of this. Um, if we're interested in democratization of the, of the, global, the, the, global, the global polity, then um, just, uh, just sort of seeing it in terms of a, a disconnected uh, soup of practices is, is I think, not enough. Um, the, the, fourth, um, the fourth possibility here is as a society, um, international society, uh, actually, sorry, I could use some more slides here. Um, um, okay, that was, the, the other theorist of a soup is um, James Rosenau. Um, the, f the fourth framing, society, um, this, this, is, this looks international society, society as featuring a set of constitutive norms and discourses that can be targets of democratization. I actually wrote um, about this in a book that uh, I published um, five years ago now called Deliberative Global Politics. Um, in that book, I stressed uh, global democratization in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the democratization of the interplay, the engagement of discourses um, in global public spheres. Um, this can actually be connected to theories um, in the weird and wonderful world of um, international relations theory, um, in particular constructivism and the so-called English school of international relations. Um, both of these uh, see the importance of constitutive norms and, um, and discourses in ordering the, the global system. Um, what I would say is that uh, um, with, with time, there is actually a process of sort of reflexive modernization that we can see at the global level um, in which uh, there's a decline in uh, hegemonic discourses. There's an increase in contestation of discourses. And so the challenge comes to be how to um, think about democratizing that contestation. But I'm going to st skate over that for the purposes of um, today's, today's presentation. And I'm actually going to um, focus on um, the, uh, the idea of a forum, introducing a particular kinds of forum at the global level, uh, and also the idea of a deliberative system, uh, which resonates uh, very strongly with recent developments in the theory of deliberative democracy. 
Um, in my last book, um, uh, sorry, uh, Foundations of Frontiers of Deliberative Governance, I actually spoke about um, uh, the systemic turn in deliberative democracy, the turn towards deliberative systems, actually away from thinking about single forums. Um, but I'm going to talk about um, single forums first. Um, and the reason I'm going to do this um, is not because I think um, any particular forum is going to produce deliberative democracy, but that the injection of particular kinds of forums into the system may help when it comes to deliberative democratization. So these may be incremental moves, um, and they may leave us far from any ideal, uh, but I think it's still worth um, thinking about these sorts of, the, these, these kinds of initiatives. Um, what I'm going to do is actually um, contrast uh, a proposal for a deliberative citizens forum, uh, we can call it a mini-public, as se well, several people yesterday referred to um, mini-publics, um, although a, a mini-public at the macro, at, at, well, not macro scale, but at the grand scale, at the global level. Um, obviously, nothing like this has um, ever been uh, attempted, although, as I will suggest, there are intimations of this. Um, there are hints that this, this could actually be done. Um, the existing proposals, though, um, that, are, that are made, uh, th that are much more prominent, um, feature something very different. They feature something like um, a parliament. Uh, there's a, 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 there's a, um, a fairly high-profile campaign for the United Nations Parliamentary Assembly. Um, UNPA. Uh, and this, this campaign has been joined, there's, it's got a website, there's, um, it's got high profile officials, um, um, including, um, uh, well, UN officials, many elected officials, um, heads of state, heads of government from different countries who, who have endorsed, um, endorsed the, uh, the proposal. Um, the reason I put um, a question mark after elected is that although they, um, although its proponents um, see election to this global this global parliamentary assembly as a, a long-term goal. They realize that in the short term it's not feasible. Uh, there are, of course, a number of authoritarian, authoritarian states which are members of the, the UN. Um, and so um, in the short term, it actually involves a lot in the way of appointment by, by national governments uh, rather, than, rather than direct elections, which is a long-term aspiration. Um, okay, um, let me just um, go over a few problems with this proposal and why I think a deliberative global citizens assembly, um, a global mini-public, might actually do better on some of these dimensions. <coughs> And the first problem is the cultural specificity of elections. Um, elections are tied to Western notions of democracy. Um, Amartya Sen, again, has pointed out that uh, democracy uh, in as elections is very much a Western construct, but democracy as, as deliberation or discussion is much more universal, manifested in different ways, in different cultures, but more universal nevertheless. Um, there are specific problems with transnational elections. Um, just look at the, the problems we have with the elections to the European Parliament, uh, which are generally not fought on on European issues, uh, people vote. Um, often, it's, it's often more of a um, uh, more to pass judgment on the performance of their national governments. So they're not fought with, the, with they're not fought on European issues. And often, um, they provide a venue for people's expressive preferences. To use the language of uh, um, my colleague Jeffrey Brennan um, and Lauren Lamasky, um, expressive preferences can be ethical, but they can sort of be uh, they can be um, prejudices of, of various kinds. Um, but the reason people um, give vent to their, to their expressive preferences in, in European elections is precisely because they view them as, in, as the, the result was inconsequential, that the result does not actually give you a government of any kind. Um, so there are specific problems with um, transnational elections, which are likely to be magnified at the, um, um, the global level. Um, uh, the United Nations Parliamentary Assembly might look like uh, um, uh, like a national parliament which only had representatives of regional parties with regional concerns. Um, a bit like the parliament of Belgium, only on a, on, on a global scale. Um, <laughs> okay, there's a China problem. Uh, China does not like elections, does not like national elections, would probably not agree to global elections. There's the United States problem, equally severe. Um, American politicians do not accept the possibility of any level um, of authority um, above that of the uh, that established in the U.S. Constitution. That is why that, that um, I, I, I said that there's, there are many officials around the world who have endorsed the uh, United Nations Parliamentary Assembly campaign, but there is not one single mainstream American politician who has done so. Um, now, uh, why would a deliberative citizens assembly do better? 
Um, the basic idea here of such a, such a session assembly would it would be, as I say, um, like a mini public. Um, it would organize. It would be organized on the basis of um, uh, something like random selection, but on a global basis. There are many domestic precursors. Um, there are actually some uh, transnational, and even one global precursor. Um, the transnational uh, precursors can be found in Europe, um, with the uh, Europolis um, Deliberative Opinion Poll conducted by um, James Fishkin and his associates uh, a couple of years ago. Um, the the global precursor is something called Worldwide Views. Um, this is a process, a deliberative, deliberative citizen process, was conducted on a national basis, but in 38 countries on the same day, September the 26, 2009, in the lead up to the uh, Copenhagen Climate Change Summit. It was the same, uh, the same process, 38 countries, same day, 100 randomly selected citizens uh, convened to produce, well, ac actually not exactly convened to produce a set of recommendations, but con convened uh, to answer a questionnaire. Um, about their their reaction to um, and their support for various proposals to to uh, uh, deal with um, deal with climate change. So that's one uh, one precursor. Uh, that wasn't actually a transnational deliberation because all the deliberations were national. What the organisers should have done but didn't uh, was take uh, one or more representative from each of those 38 countries who participated in the deliberation in each one of them, um, bring them to Copenhagen, have them deliberate there and then produce, uh, you know, have it run it as an event in parallel with the, uh, the official UN negotiations, but they didn't. Um, and so, the, uh, so that was perhaps a missed opportunity. Um, it would be, uh, the idea is it would be deliberative as well as a citizens forum, and so it would require facilitation, and it would require, of course, a lot in the way of simultaneous translation. Um, but that, well, as we know from this, this conference, that can be done, however difficult it would be on a, on a, on a multilateral level. Um, why would it do, do better in terms of the, um, the, the problems that I've uh, um, indicated? Um, cultural specificity. Well, discussion, deliberation is less culturally specific than elections, as Sen has pointed out. Um, instead of getting uh, uh, transnational elections with voting on irrelevant grounds and expressive voting, uh, we would have um, very consequential selection processes. Um, ideally, people would, would take their role seriously, as we know they do in existing citizen forums, um, and be there as citizens of the world, rather than um, as representatives of, of political parties in particular countries, which, which is likely what you get with, um, with elections. Uh, the hope would be, just as, in, just as we know from um, ordinary citizen forums, um, nationally organized, uh, that we would get a prior prioritization of um, concerns with the long term and with public goods, um, as, as I say, as, in existing, <coughs> as we see in existing citizen forums. Um, in terms of the um, China problem, uh, actually China, the, the, Chinese, the hierarchy of the Chinese Communist Party has been surprisingly open to experiments, in, uh, at least local experiments, in, in deliberation um, in China. Um, and some, uh, uh, some, of some, some of the leading figures in that hierarchy have even uh, given speeches on deliberative democracy. This is actually a bit of a worry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's a very uh, uh, ambiguous development, to say the least, uh, that, uh, it, it, that, that um, but at least uh, it means perhaps that uh, China might be less likely to, ob to object to this kind of process than uh, to, to elections. Um, the United States problem might be um, a bit, might be ameliorated. It's actually perhaps a bigger one than the China problem um, because it's an in principle object to global authority, uh, sorry, an in principle objection to global authority of any sort, not just, um, uh, not just a global parliament, elected global parliament. Um, but perhaps a citizens assembly would look sufficiently different than a legislature to make it look less like a challenge to the authority established in the U.S. Constitution. That's a bit speculative. Um, okay. Um, let me now move to the idea of a, um, of a, of a system, a deliberative system in particular. Um, it's important to emphasize that, uh, we, well we sh that, that a mini-public um, is not a deliberative democracy. Um, there are some deliberative Democrats, especially enthusiasts and and designers of, of citizen forums who, who make that mistake. Um, but I think it's best to see um, citizen forums as potentially just one part of the more general architecture of, um, of a deliberative system. Um, I think um, actually um, uh, yesterday in, the, in, the, in his comments on the first session, um, Luigi Bobbio made the, um, exactly the same point, that we should regard citizens' juries, for example, as just um, one part of a deliberative system. Um, this is, as I said, uh, consistent with the, the recent systemic turn in deliberative democracy. Uh, 
The idea of a deliberative system was first introduced by uh, Jane Mansbridge uh, 12 years ago, and it's been developed um, by a number of people, including John Parkinson, um, Caroline Hendricks, um, actually both of whom were students of mine, and both of whom got to the idea of a deliberative system before I did. Um, and the, the idea of a deliberative system um, is that uh, rather than seeking deliberative democracy in any particular forum, be it a parliament, a citizens forum, or anything else, or indeed in just the public sphere, in just the interplay of uh, 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 actors, discourses in the public sphere, um, we should instead look, at, look for interlinked, compon interlinked yet differentiated components which together can make a deliberative democracy. Now, in Mansbridge's original presentation, um, these components are very much geared to the presence of a liberal state. So she saw a deliberative system as reaching from everyday talk amongst uh, friends, um, within families, um, in cafes, um, whatever, reaching for everyday talk um, to more formal deliberation in the legislature. Um, but we can actually take the idea of a deliberative system and generalize it so it's applicable in context beyond the state, um, including the global context. Um, so what then should we look for in any deliberative system? Um, these, are, these are just um, some of the main elements that, we, that I think we should look for in any deliberative system, and we can apply this at any level, from the, the local to the global. <coughs> um, public space, um, really the public sphere, uh, where we, where we um, seek the relatively um, sort of free-flowing interchange of ideas, um, discourses, and, and, and so forth. Um, empowered space of, of public authority. Um, this can be the formal institutions of a state, um, or um, it can be, um, or it can be in the, or it can take other forms, um, especially in the global system. Um, it can also at the national level when we're talking about things like um, network governments, for example. Um, but in the global system, it might take the form of, um, for example, multilateral negotiations. Um, it might take the form of, uh, well, various forms of um, network governance, which can apply, which can apply globally. Um, it might even uh, take the form of, of states. Um, it's possible to imagine a global deliberative system in which um, uh, final authority, final th the authority to act, um, is still exercised by, by states. So we can imagine a transnational or a global public sphere uh, um, somehow um, sort of, well, in, in involving uh, much, much in the way of, um, of, of global interchange um, coexisting with public authority still exercised by states. And obviously what um, large states do, China, the US um, in particular, um, matters enormously when it comes to um, consequences for, for global outcomes. Um, think of, well, I, I might say a bit about climate change in a few moments, um, but, but of course what they do matters, matters tremendously there. Um, we also need um, some kind of transmission from public space to empowered space, and this can come in, in many forms. Um, in, uh, of course, uh, um, w within the state, um, it often takes the form of uh, electoral politics of various sorts, but there are all kinds, but there are many other um, means through which um, uh, transmission can be exerted. Um, communicative, uh, communicative means, uh, the power of argument, the power of rhetoric, and so forth. Um, non -el sorry, electoral means are not available in the global system, uh, but the non-electoral means are. Um, accountability, um, accountability again is sort of, we, we when in, in terms of um, uh, national parliamentary governance, we think of it in terms of, of uh, electoral accountability for the most part, but accountability just means, well literally, uh, the ability to give an account. And so um, we can seek um, accountability mechanisms in, 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 global, in global politics um, no less than in, than in, than in national politics. Um, and then we can also seek um, what Dennis Thompson has called uh, meta-deliberation. This is really the um, reflexive capacity of the uh, system to somehow deliberate about its own qualities, its own shortcomings in particular, and how they might be rectified. Um, in, the in the few minutes left, um, I might just, um, uh, uh, just talk very briefly about the global governance of climate change. Um, actually, I'd happily talk about this for uh, three hours rather than just three minutes. So I've been doing a lot of work on this over the last couple of years and we'll be um, in the process of um, co-authoring a, a book on this. Um, and here, it, it, um, we, we actually do try. Um, my my co-author here is um, Haley Stevenson. Uh, we do actually try to apply this idea of a deliberative system to the global governance of climate change, um, to use a deliberative system as a template by which to both um, describe, evaluate, 
and suggest some improvements to the global governance of climate change. Um, so just um, very briefly, how does the global governance of climate change look in these deliberative system terms? Um, first, um, public space. Um, in some ways, it's quite healthy. We see a variety of discourses, um, ranging from climate marketization through to climate justice to a discourse of, of denial. Um, but often, um, uh, this, this sheer variety doesn't ne necessarily lead to engagement across different discourses. Um, there are enclaves in which, dif which different discourses are present. The Klima Forum, of which is the civil society forum uh, conducted in parallel with UN negotiations. Um, in that forum, we get a discourse of green radicalism that dominates uh, with radical versions of climate justice as well, uh, but not the kinds of discourses of ecological modernization, climate marketization that we find, for example, in the World Business Summit on um, climate, various World Business Summits on climate change. Um, uh, when, look, when we, when it looks, when we uh, look at empowered space, at the multilateral negotiators in particular, um, they feature a lot of bargaining, um, some real deliberation. We've done a lot of interviews with participants. Um, unfortunately, the story is, is not necessarily a very happy one, that um, one um, veteran negotiator I interviewed uh, seemed to think that um, the, del the deliberative quality of those negotiations has actually declined over the last 15 years or so. In the 90s, the general ethos was, uh, we the world can cope with this collective problem. Now, national interests are much more dominant than partial interests. Um, there are multiple channels for transmission. Um, <coughs> Uh, civil society activists are actually physically present at the multilateral negotiations. Uh, whether they're heard or not is a different question. Um, often they're, they're heard much more readily by negotiators from small states who use civil society organization representatives um, as sources of information and expertise, um, sometimes um, even as sources of negotiators. Um, so uh, uh, a number of Pacific Islands, for example, um, use um, Australian activists as their negotiators within the UN forum. Um, that's just one channel, there are multiple ones. Um, but some discourses don't make it through. Um, green radicalism, for example, uh, tends not to make it from the public sphere to the official negotiations. Um, some discourses make it much more easily, for example, ecological modernization um, and, uh, and climate marketization. There is some narrative accountability in the system. For example, um, governments often give briefings, government negotiators often give briefings to their own uh, NGOs and, uh, and media. Little deliberative accountability. There's very little two-way interchange that goes on. Very weak meta-deliberative meta capacity. Um, climate change has never had its Bretton Woods moment uh, where the global financial system was created after World War II. Um, instead, the, the system has gradually accumulated over time and has accumulated some real oddities um, in deliberative, um, well, in, in deliberative, in democratic, uh, really in, in, in any terms, in terms of uh, sort of reaching any kind of decisive um, agreement. Um, and finally, any deliberation that does occur, the deliberative system that is present, um, is not decisive. Uh, that when it comes to global outcomes, uh, most of what goes on globally that's consequential for climate change is not affected by what goes on in that, um, in that deliberative s system. Um, partly as a result of the, the failure to reach any comprehensive multilateral um, agreement, um, partly due to the fact that um, agreements that are reached, um, so for example, the Copenhagen Accord at the last minute two years ago, um, was reached as a, as a bargaining bargain between a small number of players, which essentially ignored the, any prior deliberation that, that occurred. Um, okay, that's a very, um, very short story. Uh, that's the, um, the three-minute version. Uh, the the three-hour version is much more, uh, much more extensive um, and also involves um, uh, just a number of moves that could be, could be made um, to improve the global governance of climate change in deliberative terms. Um, that wouldn't necessarily guarantee we would get glo effective global action on climate change, um, but it would be, would, uh, would I would argue, um, uh, help contribute um, to a more effective global response. Um, okay, so um, the general point then um, is that deliberative thinking in particular um, is applicable at the global level, um, that we can think of global democracy uh, productively in deliberative terms. There are a number of options for, for, for doing this. Um, so when it comes to the global democracy, uh, we shouldn't, uh, as, as a skeptic, say just give up on the idea that it's obviously, you know, that it's too remote, that the preconditions don't exist. Um, I think the only question is how do we do it rather than whether we do it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.